Welcome back, YouTubers, to another episode of Jack of All Trades. I'm back with Kaylin, as always, and Sam, our producer. And uh, hopefully no technical difficulties this week. Last week was a nightmare. <laughs> what did it take us, like, four hours, and we got, like, 45 minutes out of it or something? 45 <laughs> minutes of the worst... <laughs> Of the worst minutes of the show. <laughs> that was yeah. so bad. It was so bad. Um, right. But um I think but I, Yeah, but so I, I mentioned on, on Instagram earlier that we're gonna do this this as a back to basics episode because I think me and you both kind of realized that um it, even with us, it's worth repeating a lot of things, even to ourselves, just because you forget you get lost in the trade and you kind of lose sight of things. And so it, it's it, yeah. there's some value in just repeating the, the fundamentals. Yeah, well, that's the biggest thing, too, is the market's, like, you know, they're changing constantly. Like, anybody who's good and successful, or like, you know, like, you know, we're looking at the markets every day because they're always changing, right? So if you're not paying attention, kind of reassessing constantly, like, that's why I'm such a, you know, a big fan of, like, data and just saving all your charts, saving all your trades, because when things start to go a little bit weird, you can usually look back and you'll even end up going back a week to the way you were trading a week ago and be like, oh, like, why did I stop doing that? And then, you know, it just kind of resets you a little bit, so... Everybody has to do it. Yeah, I find like it, it happened to me a couple times this this past winter during the trading. Like you kind of just get into this rhythm where you get lost in the weeds and you kind of lose sight of everything. You just kind of lost and wandering. Yeah, and, you know, that's when you make start to make all the mistakes. You just lose. You just forget all your lessons. I have a th my theory behind that is that because like you know every market cycle kind of changes constantly. Like if you look at like small caps, like all the stuff that I'm trading all the time, like. They'll be really, really hot for like a month. There'll be tons of stuff going on or like, you know, two months and then they'll kind of slowly taper off and then you'll get like basically nothing for, you know, a few weeks or another month or whatever. And then they'll kind of come back, maybe like half strength and they'll go away again and then they come back like crazy for another few months. So like for me anyways, I feel like I feel like when I kind of get into that funk is because like, you know, when markets are hot, there's so many just spectacular setups all the time that are just like perfect. You can just nail them with size they have you know they're moving 50 percent a day kind of thing and then all of a sudden with that you know that 50 percent a day kind of starts to dwindle down and down and down it, it just kind of happens over a few weeks so you don't really realize it and then all of a sudden you know you're looking at your scanners and you're like oh okay this one looks pretty good it's up you know 14 percent and then you're trying to like hammer into it the same way you would one that's up like a hundred percent and it just it just doesn't work out the same way and you're looking for bigger moves and they're just not there and then you know, it's kind of like, what the hell is going on? And then that's when I'll look back at my other charts and be like, oh, okay. You know, it's because it's the thing is just not moving. I shouldn't even be trading this. There's just nothing else going on. <laughs> it was the best of a worst, the worst situation. Yeah, that's pretty clutch that you save your, uh, your charts. Eh? I, I don't. And I found myself having that exact problem uh, when I was trading Bitcoin futures. Because it's exactly as you described, the, the volatility was huge, but it starts to just, just compress over time. Yeah. And I'm trying to get the same returns over this compressed uh, price movement, and I'm just getting chewed up to more and more. Yeah, that's exactly what happens to me. That's why I say, like, I have my, I have my charts saved for the past, like, three, four years. Like, I have thousands of patterns of my trades. <laughs> wow. How so many patterns kind of... do, you, do you play, or do you? How many patterns? Yeah, or have you, like, tried a bunch, and you kind of refine now, just pick a few that you like? Patterns that I've like given my own names to and have their own kind of setup. I've probably tried like at least a hundred that I've like tracked over the years. And but now I play like it's it's basically one. Like it's really just one pattern that I do now. But there's like there's like variations to it. So like with this one pattern, like I might go long, I might go short. Like it's it's just kind of based all around like one little setup that I see. So it's kind of a like I don't know. It's like maybe you could say I have like four patterns that I play, four or five kind of thing, but like, I'm always looking for the same kind of thing. And then it just depends. Like, cause I was saying to you the other day, you know, like, like the shorts and stuff that I do, like they're so clean cut now, like the way that I get into them that I know if, you know, if I get blown out on my short, I know it's going to be a long. So I'll just flip my position and go long basically. And same thing with, you know, if I'm going long and then it crashes, then I know it should be a short. So I kind of find like that, that like real butter zone, which is like, you know, it just, it's that pivotal moment on this, on this talk where it's either going to go up or it's going to go down. So like, if I think it's going to go down initially, then I'll short it. But then if it doesn't and it blows me out, it'll hit my stop. Then I know it's, it's going to be a long and I'll just flip long and, and ride it up. So it's basically one setup and I'll just, I'll just take both sides of it. So following that, how long did it take you to kind of get to that position? Like, 
uh, where you're half. kind of three and a half years. <laughs> every single day. <laughs> yeah, it sounds about right. Like, yeah. It, what do you think took longer to train? Well, I kind of know the answer, but I want to ask, like, uh, th did it take longer to get used to reading the technicals or did it take longer to kind of strain your emotions and your mentality? 100% your emotions. Yeah, right. Like I could, I could show like you, I could show Sam, I could show Brendan, I could show anybody how to trade the way I trade. And like, probably like two or three days, if I like sat down with them, I could teach them everything I know like technically and it's very straightforward like it's really easy but it's doing it in the moment and you know not panicking out of trades and not adding too much and knowing when to take a little bit off and add a little bit more on like it's all those little details in the moment or like you know you gotta let you gotta have be able to deal with a little bit of pain if it goes against you kind of thing but you know still stick to your original plan like it's just that was the hardest part of it and it's because like like, you know, I've talked about this before, but like when I first started trading, like at the time I was at like, you know, a job I hated and I was like, oh, this is going to be my way out of here kind of thing. Right. So I was just like rushing and I was like stressing myself out and like every lot, like, cause you know, like I've never been one of those guys, like, like all the, you know, all the, all the meme guys and stuff now where they're like, oh, it's, I got 20,000 bucks laying around. Let's just throw it all into Dogecoin or AMC. Like I never, ever was like that. Like the, the biggest loss I ever had when I first started trading was like 280 bucks or something like that. And like outside of that, it was like the next, the, the next time I had a loss bigger than that was like two and a half years later. Like I just, I, I was always like super risk cautious. And then when I did start trading, like I, when I, after I had that big loss, I started trading with one share just to like try and figure stuff out because then I could, you know, I could buy one share. I could let it go, you know, $5 against me on a $3 stock. And it, you know, I lost five bucks. Right. So I started, I have, I have to ask, I, I have to ask, is that your biggest loss that you've realized or like any direction, like unrealized too? Um, no, like my, my biggest loss I realized was, I think it was 700 bucks us. Okay. And then the next biggest one was that one that was in my first like three months that was 280 or some odd dollars. But yeah, like outside of that, like I, I, I really don't risk more than like maybe a hundred bucks or 150 bucks a trade kind of thing. Because like the way I trade is like, I, I don't, and like I'll, I'll talk about that in a minute here when we get into the chart, but like I don't, I don't dive into things like full size immediately. Like I always, I always start in really small because I know what I'm looking for now. And then once it confirms, that's when I'll load into it really big. So I always make sure. And then I take stuff off the table like right away. Like as soon as it goes in my direction a little bit, I always take some off because like the goal for me is like, I only want to be in like a really risky situation for a really short period of time. And then once it goes in my favor a little bit, I can take off some of that size because usually it's more size than I want. And then that way, wherever my stop is, I'm, you know, at, at this point now I'm looking at you know, a 15 to one risk reward potentially, because I've already locked in enough gains that if it goes to my stop, maybe I'm only going to lose 20 bucks because I've already locked in, you know, a hundred. And then if it goes in my favor, you know, maybe I'm going to make five, six, seven, eight hundred dollars Right. But I'm basically risking 20 bucks. So I just, something just hit me just now. The importance of vocabulary in, uh, in trading or investing. Because you say risk, and I knew exactly what you mean. And not, even though I'm mostly investing, I still call it money at risk, right? Mm -hmm. But I, I feel like a lot of the people starting are not calling it risk. They're calling it investment. And so that mistake, I think, changes your mind a little about what is actually happening with that, with that money. You're putting it out there in the ether. If you, right. if you say it's an investment, there's the implication that this is a positive thing, that it's going to grow. But it, but it really is a risk. That's yeah. honestly what it is. And they have to view it. We have to view it as such, right? Yeah, exactly. Like it, yeah, it just depends on what you're looking at, right? Like if you, you just have to really know the difference between what's a trade and what's an investment, right? And like, you know, I know we've said this, like, I don't want to talk about it anymore because we've talked about it so much, but like, you know, Dogecoin and AMC, like stuff like that, like, like those, those are trades. So like, if you're in that because of a trade, that's fine. Like, you know, I would trade that stock. You would trade that stock if we saw our I set. tried to. Yeah, exactly. So, you know, it's, 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 a, but it's a trade. Like, you know, you look at, you look at Dogecoin, like it's not going to be anything. Like you look at AMC, they're like billions of dollars in debt. Like it's, it, movie theaters aren't even going to be around in the next 10 years. Like it's not something you're going to buy and hold 
for you know the next 40 years and and you know that'll be a retirement fund like it's just it's just not that type of thing right now unless the company completely reinvents itself right but all that aside if you're looking at something that's you know an investment and you could definitely speak more on this than i can you know you're you're good with those pullbacks you're good with those those drawdowns because you're in this thing for the long haul like you know it's a company that's changing the world like you know it's gonna there's gonna be nothing like this like in 20 years it's gonna be so big it doesn't even matter that's having a bad year or a bad two years kind of thing right so like yes you're still putting some risk on the table but the risk at that point is almost like to me it's almost like a like a fundamental risk like it's not really like a dollar risk like yeah. the way i look at it you know with with some of my investments in my companies i'm looking at it like okay you know i have x amount of dollars invested in this company so like you know if it does go way down and i'm down like 50 percent on my position say then i just do what you do you know i'd look at the company i'd be like is this company still solid are they still doing what i want them to do are they still profitable like, all these things that you want to look at and then if the answer to all that stuff is yes then it's like you know to me i'm, I'm still happy in that position right whereas all of a sudden if things are changing and then you're going then you're going down maybe it's time to you know take a little bit off the table or you know kind of reassess your position yeah i think like i think we 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 we, we keep saying this but i don't know if it's registering to people is when i have caught some conversations i still get that same confusion like they'll talk about an investment as if it was a trade and sometimes they'll say it's a trade but it's make it sound like an investment and i think that confusion if you don't have clarity on what your intent is then i don't I'm, then i don't see a way where you could decide where is your exit if you're going to exit right right how do you how do you set up targets if if one day it's an investment and the next day it's a trade and it just changes right yeah yeah like right now like just an example i can think of right now like gra is that one that i'm in right so it's uh it's like to me it's a bit of both like just to give an example here so so like it's um i can't pull up the chart because it won't show up on my das trader thing here but it's uh you know it was hanging around like three bucks for a while went up to yeah maybe you could pull it up there yeah i'll pull it up okay yeah you can keep talking yeah so so like i started i started buying into this thing because it's uh it's a company they produce graphene and they're you know they're they're basically you can think of them as the industrial side of um like ev like batteries and all that kind of stuff so like i'm looking at the way the world's going right now and you know electric vehicles are such a big game changer in the industry. And when I look at this, this is kind of like the background basically that, you know, it's the industrial side of, yeah, there it is there. So it's the industrial side of, um, of electric vehicles essentially. So is that on the daily or? Oh, uh, weekly. Yeah, so I go to the daily just so you can see a little bit better. So basically I always kind of, yeah, zoom out a bit so you can see like right back in the last year. So like I, I've liked this company, this is a Canadian company and I've liked them since like last year. So I, I started buying in, like when I first started buying in was around like, you know, $2 and 50 cents or something like that. And I first did it as a trade. Like I was like, okay, this is a solid company. It's moving pretty fast. So on big volume. So yeah, basically right around there, David is where I started getting in. And then I actually sold it right up. I think the highest sell I had um, right in January or at the end of December was 483. So I almost like I almost sold it like right at the very top, um, but I, that was the trade for me. Like I liked the company, so I wasn't worried about it just tanking. But at that time, you know, for me that was a trade. So then after that, I was like, okay, I want to start actually sizing into this thing a little bit more for like a, a longer investment. So you know, over the past few months, like I've loaded up a few thousand shares, like kind of through the three to four dollar range. Um, so my average right now is like a little bit below three fifty. And then um, obviously you can see that big green day we had there on, what was it Thursday? And then it held up pretty good. So like, you know, I'm, I'm basically expecting this thing to go up quite a bit over the next little while. So with, with the amount of shares I've accumulated, um, I'm gonna be like, my plan right now is basically, cause it is a quick mover. Um, I'm gonna be trading around it. So I'm gonna be, I'm gonna, you know, pull maybe a thousand shares aside and I'll be kind of selling that into pops and rebuying on dips. and then I'll have my core of like a few thousand more shares that I'll just hold on to and basically use that in, as an investment. But I mean, just recently you can see it kind of triple bottom right, right around $3. So when I was looking at that, I was thinking, okay, you know, I have a couple options here. Like if this thing drops below three, it's probably going to go down towards like $2 where that last support area was. So, you know, 
when I was thinking about it, I'm looking at it like, okay, well, you know, we'll keep an eye on it around three bucks. If it does drop down, I'm still super confident in the company itself. So like, I'm willing to basically take that pain, so to speak, because it is a solid company and I am confident in what they're doing. Um, whereas if I was in that just for a trade, like just to hit that move, I would have cut it under three bucks because then I don't know what's going to happen after that. Right. So this one for me, it's, it's, you know, this isn't a buy and hold until retirement kind of thing. This will probably end up being like, you know, maybe a year or two year kind of thing. Like I'm just going to play this one by year, but, uh, I am investing in it and I'm using maybe about like a fifth of my position size to trade around in the interim, just because like, you know, as you can see here in like a week, you know, we went up like a buck a share. So that's, you know, those are pretty quick gains that I can lock in with a thousand shares here and there if it kind of keeps making these moves every week or every few weeks, right? So, yeah, uh, I find it interesting, like, well, first of all, congratulations on this like 90% uh, trade, like that was like, <laughs> like three months, like that's, that's pretty badass. Yeah, but, that's um, pretty <laughs> <laughs> but it's it it sounds like even your investment is still kind of like a, a swing or position trade, which I get. I, I I'm kind of doing the same now too. Right. Yeah, but it it depends though, right? Because like I have you know like I have Amazon, like I own Apple, like those those things. I'm not even like I don't even look at those. I look at those like every few months because I just like I'm I'm holding those forever. Like you know those are those yeah. are like Nvidia, right? Those are ones that I'm basically holding forever. Um, you know, the S and P 500, like it's not something that I'm trading or swinging or anything like that. So, um, I think that's the key is, you know, what we were just talking about is that if, if it's a trade, you know, you got to know that it's a trade, but it's don't trick yourself into thinking it's investment, right? Like again, with all these, you know, there's so many new investors in the market and that's, that's what people think. They're like, oh, I'm in this stock and you know, it's, it's gone way up. Like, this is a great investment. Like, this is just, I'm just going to hold this thing forever. It's like, no, you know, it doesn't work like that. Like <laughs> those aren't, those aren't investments. Those are trades. There's a big difference. You got to look at the underlying company if you're going to think long-term. Yeah. <clears throat> Excuse me. <clears throat> that brings me back to something you said earlier. It, it, uh, it hit me just now. Like um, you, were, you were saying like our perspective of like GME and, and, and AMC is kind of different than uh, basically what the Wall Street bets are, are looking at. Right. Cause like, so we take those two, the stock price did what it did, right? But if they were in our hands, we would have been selling on the way up and probably be sitting in cash right about now, at least. 100%, yeah. Like, right. And so like, that's, that's the, that's the major difference, right? The stocks, these are going to do whatever it's going to do, but whether or not you're profitable is kind of independent of the price as well. Right. Yeah. And I yeah, think I just, people um, need to realize that. Yeah. That's the biggest thing is that, you know, you. It just like, you know, it was, it was Michael Burry, right? That said, we said last week, he said that we're in for like the crashes the size of houses basically on all these retail traders. And like, you know, I, I think he's right to a certain point because like we have, we have so many new traders and I just, it's really, I just think there's a huge misconception between what they're thinking as an investment and as a trade. So like they're getting these, these stocks that are spiking way up and they're, they're buying more and they're just averaging up, averaging up. And it's like, you should be doing the complete opposite. You should be selling little pieces. Like, you know, like for me, for example, like if I, like I play high volatility stuff, right? So like, it's like I just said, like I like to sell a chunk so that wherever my stop loss is, if it hits there, I'm out for zero. Like that's when I can sit on my hands and say, okay, let's just let this thing do what it's going to do. Because there's at that point, I'm trading with zero risk. There's absolutely no risk to me as soon as I'm ready to move my stop loss to a point where my, my stop is going to hit and it's going to be zero dollars on the trade then I'm completely free to let it do whatever, whatever I want. Right. But if you're in something like that, where you, you know, you haven't traded before and you have, you don't know what levels to look at, you don't know where to cut it, like any of that kind of stuff. And, you know, not even like, not even these, these meme stocks is, you know, we talk about them way too much, but just, just with anything, like, you know, if, if you don't, if you don't have a really good understanding of the technical analysis, which doesn't take too, too long to learn, then you won't know where to put your risk. And then all of a sudden if the stock starts selling off, you know, maybe it breaks a key level and you're thinking, oh, maybe, you know, maybe it'll rebound, but maybe under that key level, like it's got another 20, 30% to fall before it hits something else. Right. So that's what we mean when we say risk on a trade. If you're going to buy something, if you're going to buy like the S&P 500 index and hold it forever, you could have bought it right in March of 2020 before the crash. You could have thrown your whole life savings into that. If you're going to hold it for 20 years, then guess what? Here we are a year later and you're comfortably in profits even after that massive crash, right? So, but if you do that on something that's a trade, you're, it's just going to stay down there and then you're screwed. Yeah, I think, 
that that's like so when you enter a trade you already have an idea well obviously you have an idea of why you what where you entered but you have before you entered you already had a clear clue of where you want to exit as well right that to me is what yeah. makes it a trade you, you have a plan like yeah. going going into something like going into a stock and just saying i'm i'm expecting it to go up is not a plan. <laughs> like, yeah yeah well it's like like you look at the indexes right like the s p like i own the s p but i'm not like i'm gonna sell it when it's two thousand dollars a shit like you know i'm not gonna sell it i'm just gonna hold it forever right whereas like if i'm doing a trade then i have a set risk so i'm like okay if i'm doing a trade i'm risking let's say i'm risking a dollar on this trade i need to know where i'm aiming to take profits because if I'm risking a dollar and my profit target's 50 cents away, I'm not going to take that trade, right? If I'm risking a dollar, my profit target's $5 away, then I'll probably take that trade. So like, unless you know where you're going to sell, you shouldn't be taking the trade because you need a good risk reward. If you don't have a good risk reward, then you're just gambling. And I think more than that, I, 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 I wish we, we talked about, we said this on, uh, on camera last time, but it's like, I keep saying like, um, like, People, if, if they figure out, if they figure out what their intentions are, then you can, you just need to exercise a little um, discipline and then that's what will get you into profit, right? Because, because the problem with, and it, I'm sure it, it happens with us, but we're able to control it because we have experience. But like, if you enter a trade and you don't have an exit, what happens is your expectations change with the price. Right. Yeah. You might put a thousand dollars into something and go, I just wanted to do a 50 percent, you know, 500 bucks. Right. But what if it does double? It goes to two thousand. Suddenly your dreams get a little bit bigger. It's like maybe I can put a down payment on a car. Yeah. Right. Then it does another five. Actually, like, oh, maybe I can get a better car. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like, exactly. Never leave. Yeah. No, I know. That's that's the biggest problem is, you know, you, you got to stick to your plan. That's that's why I always say, you know, like it's 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 so much more comfortable to just take a bunch off, sell a bunch of little pieces and then. You know, maybe the thing's gone up 200% from where you entered. Like at that point for me personally, I'd probably have like maybe a fifth or a sixth of my position left, like if any. And then, you know, if I have a, if I have a fifth of my, you know, let's say I locked in, you know, let's say you lock in a thousand bucks or something like that. And then, you know, now you have like a hundred dollars or, or $150 still unrealized at that point. It's like, okay, I got a thousand bucks in the bank. If it drops all the way back down and hits my stop loss, I'm out for break even. But at that point, your stop loss is probably higher already anyways. So you're probably still gonna take profits on that last piece. But if you're only if you're just sitting there and there's only that tiny little piece left, then you have no stress. I mean, you know, you can sit there and sure, maybe it goes up another thousand percent. It's like, oh, you know, I could have had this, could have had that. But most of the time, it's just gonna stress you right the hell out. <laughs> and if it dips down, it's a lot more painful to go from it's a lot more painful to see a huge green number and then watch that huge green number turn into a red number and then sell and then realize that red number. It's a lot less painful to have a whole bunch of green in the bank and then watch it go way higher and say, oh, I could have had more, but at least I still have a thousand bucks, right? Like, <laughs> it's a really good point. I, you're right. It's, it's a little bit easier, at least for me, I, it's a little bit easier for me to deal with taking less profit than looking at that exact chart where you see a big green and a big red going, wow, I'm literally doing everything wrong. I didn't sell at the top and I'm selling on the way down. Like it's the complete yeah. opposite of what you mean. Yeah, yeah. But again, that's that's again why I always I always say save the charts and everything because like, you know, there's always those times where like I'll short something because, you know, I short stuff most of the time and, you know, I'll, I'll cover into my levels and then, you know, let, let's say I made, you know, over over the range, I, I was like a dollar or something like that. So I was covering in pieces all the way and my bottom one was like a dollar from where I entered. And then all of a sudden, you know, it breaks a key level after that and it just tanks like another three dollars. I'm like, well, fuck, you know, I could have made so much more money. But then I'll look back at all the other charts I've saved that are the same pattern and I'll look at them and be like, oh, well, you know, when it breaks that level, that only happens one every 20 times every other time it hits where my last cover was and then bounces way back up so i'm not going to be mad because that's just a one in 20 chance and i'm not taking that gamble and so i'm guessing you learned that because you made the wrong decisions and it kind of stuck right yeah exactly like i've had times too on those where like it'll break that level and i'll be like shit, and then i'll reshort it but now i'm like way down on the chart and then it'll just you know it'll wick below that line and come right back up and then I'm riding this thing up, trying to size back in, and then I end up taking a lot. And then, you know, it's just 
And like, but that's the, that's the mental thing, right? It just screws with your head. And then you think you don't know what you're doing. And yeah. it's, you need, you need such a strict set of rules. If you're going to be trading, it's like, you can't waver from them. You have to set out whatever your rules are and you cannot waver from them. Otherwise it'll just drive you insane. I know from experience. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I've, I've been there and like, I started it to, I started investing years ago, but like I, I got into trading about 2017. Mm -hmm. And like, I'm, I've, so I've lived everything that you're describing and I feel like the, the lessons that we're using to be profitable can only have been learned by losing badly. Yeah, for sure. Like you, I think, I think we, we, we have to put it out there. There's, there's, this is literally one of those things where there's no shortcut. You have to lose money to learn that lesson. I would, I would be shocked if somebody was just naturally that just had that kind of you know, a discipline. Yeah. Yeah. There's like, we've talked about this before. How you hear, you always hear these guys who's like, Oh, he just started trading three months ago and he's already making millions of dollars. And then, you know, he just does that for the rest of his life and makes, you know, $10 million a year kind of thing. It's like, well, yeah, but there's also only so many people in the Olympics. There's also, you know, one, there's only one Mr. Olympia. Like, you know, there's only one guy that can win the race. There's only one guy that wins the PGA. Like, there's elite people in everything, right? The normal, like the mass of the population, it takes a lot longer. Like, you know, they say like the average time to become a successful, like actual trader is three to five years, potentially more. And then obviously if you're working full time, like you and I were, it could potentially take you, you know, seven, eight, nine years before you're actually in a pretty good spot. So it's, it's, there's so many other factors. You can't compare yourself to other people like that. Yeah, and and like feel like that um that goes back to the famous thing. It's been, I think it's been proven over and again. It's like if you with dedicated practice, you can master something with ten thousand hours, and that should be yeah. about three to four years. <laughs> it's so weird how that works. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It, it's it, but it's just the way it is. Like it takes time. But I want to show Sam, Sam, if you could show my screen. Sorry, kidding. Um, because because just going on what you were saying earlier, um, I I it, I mentioned this before, but I, I think it's worth mentioning again, like my best trade was not the one where I made the most money. My best trade was the one where I did everything right and not because of luck, but because of I just I, you know, I it's like when you're driving, you see the fucking pothole and you just you just swerve to miss it. It's like you you, you see it and you react to it. Right. Yeah. X paying X paying was this trade. It was last year. So I I'm I'm obviously bullish EV. So I was aware of this company early on. So I bought in here. I was it? I bought in, I think around the $20 range, somewhere around here, like a few weeks after it IPO. would And what happened was um, it went up to, I think, 23 bucks. So at that time, I hadn't refined my trading strategy yet. So my rule for myself was every 10% take some profit. So I bought in at 20 bucks, you know, it, it went hit to, it hits, I think $22, something 20, $23. And I didn't take 10%. I, I took um, a 50% thing. So basically took my, half my risk off. Right. And, and within two weeks, it just ripped, it ripped. What did it do? It ripped 180, 190%. Yeah. And, and I saw that and I was like, shit. And like, it yeah. didn't happen. Like it happened over a month, but in real time, it's actually, not that fast like there was a four week period right where this happened yeah. and every every day of those four weeks i'm going should i have sold should i be buying in right now like yeah like what's what's happening and every time i'm expecting a pullback it clearly didn't pull back it just kept ripping like 180 right. percent in four weeks is no joke right but i was just like no like i was like fuck it like if i don't make money on this one i don't make money on this one i just i just can't make that same fucking mistake again because just i will feel like dirt yeah yeah that, that comes with experience though right like you know that as well as i do that we don't chase stuff anymore because yeah. as soon as you, you'll have a little bit of a profit and then it'll rip higher you'll try and buy in more and then you'll lose and you'll be so mad and then it'll go higher again <laughs> and so this was my plan so i, I was getting uh I, I so i love the fibs right so yeah. i put up the fib after it hit the top it, i think i waited like a week and a half so I pulled it from the bottom to the top and I, was, and I put my order right at the 618 level right there. So about 30, I think I bought it at 38 bucks. Yeah. And so I just waited for this thing and to come down and it hit my order. I was like, shit. And the thing is like, the 618 is like, I think a 67% uh, target. So it's like 67% of the time it'll, it'll retrace to that area. So okay. more often than not. 
but I was prepared to say like, okay, maybe it doesn't hit because it's ripped up so high. But if it does, that's where I put my order. So I put my order. I was patient. It hit. And so I got into position. I was like, oh shit, this is great. But again, like I already knew what my exit was going to be. So I pulled another fib and I said, I'm going to sell at the 618. Mm. So bought here, sold here, and it fell down. And so within that, <clears throat> I want to say that was a three month period. I did like three trades, you know, in out, in out, whatever. And it, it wasn't that much money, but it was like, it's still my most proud um, trade ever because I stuck to the plan. I was aware of everything and I stuck to the plan. It's like, you know, it just feels great when, it, when, when you did the right thing and it works out. Yeah. See, that is like the most pivotal moment. Like is once, once your goal and once, you, once the best feelings come from executing the perfect trade, that's when your whole trading career just takes like a huge turn to the upside. Like that, that's what happened to me too. Like for the longest time, I was always focused on the money, could never be consistent, like always having problems. As soon as like I started getting some trades and then like I was just, I was just nailing these trades like beautifully, like, you know, top ticking them to the penny, like covering right where I should be, like all this kind of stuff. I was like, you know, I hit these trades. I'm like, wow, that was such a sick trade. And then I'll look like, I'll look, you know, at the top, you know, maybe I made 20 bucks, right? I'll look at it and be like, that was, I don't even care. That was amazing. Like that was so perfect. It's because I can look at the chart where my executions were and it'll just be like mint, right? That's the best feeling. Like even, even some of my losses, man. Like remember, I don't even remember like a few weeks back, I showed you one where like, it was a, it was a stock, I shorted it at like 12 bucks and then I covered it at like, you know, 12, 20 or 1230 or something like that. I can't remember what it was. And then it like within a day, it ripped all the way up to like $25. So like you see the chart and it's like this big. And then, you know, here's my, my trade is down here. And I, you know, I took a tiny loss on it, but like, I was so proud of that because I was like, I stuck to my plan perfectly and it ripped like 50% against me, but I didn't, you know, I only lost what I was planning to lose. So you just brought up another thing that, well, you, you know, very well, cause um, you've read the books and I, I think I'm pretty sure I heard it from you, but like, but it was a great point. It's that like one wrong move could wipe out 10 of your best trades. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Especially if you're short, right? Yeah. If you're yeah. short, you can, like, you know, like I hear a lot of stories of guys that are like, oh, I trade for two, three months. I'm making money like crazy. And then I lose it all in one trade because that's, that's all it takes, man. <laughs> like, that's, if you're not careful, that's all it takes is one trade, right? And, and so that's the thing. Like, I've been wanting to trade for the better part of a year now. And there's been three targets, all three of which I would have been amazing shorts. But knowing what I know about shorting, I've still been too chicken shit to pull the trigger. Because I'm like, it's literally the opposite of going long. Your downside is unlimited. Your upside yeah. is capped. If the stock goes to zero, you double your money. It has to go to zero just for a double. That's... The odds are shit, <laughs> right? Yeah, I, I, you, you could argue that. I just have, I always have an easier time seeing when stuff's going to fall and when it's going to go up. Well, so so that's so that's the thing. Like you have, well, you you've dedicated time to learning uh, how to short. I haven't, and I probably won't, just because I can't. I just can't get past the risk factor. And mm. so I think that's another point where like people need to do what uh, they're comfortable doing. Because if you're not, then you're just kind of swimming against the tide, you know, it just doesn't yeah. work. Yeah, for sure. Like that's, that's why like the way, the way, like, well, here, let's Sam, if you want to pull up my chart, this is just, uh, this is like kind of a, an example of a long, um, Space? Galaxy? Okay. Or Virgin Galactic? Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Oh, fucking so, sucks. Yeah, so this one here, um, so I just wanted to show you guys this because like, you know, this, this is the sort of stuff that I'll play around on. Like, you know, it's a, it's like an aerospace company, like David, you might even know more about it than I do, but <laughs> um, like, basically like, you know, I, I don't really care too much about companies in my trades. Um, but this one, like, you know, it's got a, it's, <laughs> you always laugh at that. I love that. No, but I love it. I fucking love it. <laughs> to be honest, I didn't even know what the name of this company was. I had to research it before we, before we started the podcast. <laughs> <laughs> here i am up at like 6 a.m at night doing fundamental analysis and you're like just like what is this what is this spice thing yeah, <laughs> yeah that's cool maybe they make maybe they make food or something or seasonings uh, look at it like oh it's a spaceship company <laughs> but anyways 
So, you know, this it's it's got like 160 or 170 mil float. It's got like 20% of the float is short. So um, you can see, you know, in the past here, it's had like these pretty big movers. Um, you know, earlier this year, it had a pretty big spike and then it came way down. So just recently, um, ironically enough, on, on Friday last week, you know, we had this huge volume stick. I looked at the news and they <laughs> they filed like a couple of lawsuit new like lawsuit things. And then there was also like some FAA approval. So I guess the FAA approval over overturned the uh, the fear from the lawsuits. But um, anyways, I just kind of wanted to walk through this a little bit because um, it's a pretty good long setup. So the way that I always look at my charts, um, it depends on it depends on the time frame I'm trading. So for me personally, I always get my risk off the candle charts um, because I need to see the wicks, like I need to see like where that lowest or that highest price point was. But I always get my my entry levels and my areas of interest from the line chart because like just personally for me, it just kind of eliminates all the noise. I can just see it like, you know, like when I look at this, like this big arc, like I can't, you know, I look in there, I can't really see any lines in that. Like it just kind of looks like a mess to me. So um, I will flip this over to the line chart here. Just, see just jump in for a sec. That piece of news was like big because it was basically the pivotal to their mission. Like they, so Virgin Galactic has always been wanting to commercialize um, space travel for as like uh, uh, entertainment. Basically, you're not going anywhere. You just want to go feel the zero G kind of thing. And they got oh. FAA, FAA approval to um to to do that. They did a test flight and apparently it was successful. Oh, all right. That sounds pretty good. <laughs> um, not that it matters yeah. to you. No, it usually doesn't really. It probably should a little bit, but um, yeah. So this is this is like, I mean, to me, it just makes it a lot clearer. Like I can see really defined levels. You know, I can see really defined bases. I can see really defined tops. That that big jumbled kind of mess that we had over here. Now you know we have a pretty clear support right there. Pretty clear support right there. You know, another couple levels up here. So it just cleans it up. That's why I like using the line chart to find my my areas of interest. Um. So if we look at this chart, you know, we had we had this kind of big steady sell off for a while. And what happened afterwards is we had like this big run up. So if you look down here, you know, we had some pretty decent volume and that's when the stock kind of spiked up really quick. Right. So we're talking like, you know, 1550 up to like, you know, 26, 27 bucks. Right. So it's a pretty fast move. So what I look for personally, you know, I, I call it kind of like, you know, like where does it look like it kind of fell off the earth sort of thing? Like that's what I like to look for in the line chart. So. To me, like those levels like would be up here because like this level right here is kind of like that's kind of like your last support level right before it really kind of sold off. And then same thing would be, you know, to me again would be right here because, you know, that's that's where we bounced off of that huge sell off. And then, you know, we had some consolidation up here. And then as soon as it broke that line, it kind of it kind of sold off pretty hard again. So this is like this is a really key area of interest for me. Um, and then what I'd be looking for basically on this is the one day line chart is instead of trying to chase up this spike, you know, what you're looking for is for it to to get through these levels. If you're thinking long, and if you're thinking short, you want to see it reject off these levels. So like for this particular setup, like I wouldn't be trying to short this because it was already so beaten down anyways. So I'd be kind of looking to go long. So what I'm looking for is instead of chasing this up, like, yeah, you know, I have to buy above this line, which is much higher. But there's way less risk because this is such a this is such a solid level and you can see here on the line chart you know it ran up it hit that line you know basically bang on pulled back a bit and then came through so like you know to the point we were talking about earlier like you know how to size into stuff and set your risk and all that kind of stuff for me like once once this got through here i'd be risking off of this bottom right here like i'd be risking off of that um you know that 25 70 area but I'd get my exact risk off the candle chart. So I'll show that in a minute. I'll just draw this line here for a second. So that's kind of like a key level now. But the way that I would trade this personally, um, long or short, would be I'd, si I'd, I'd get in a little bit up here. So like once it started to spike up, I'd put on, you know, maybe like a quarter of my size sort of thing. Just get into it, you know, get a feeler for it. That way if it goes straight up, then at least I have some, you know, I'm not going to be trying to panic buy. And then I look to try and buy a pullback like right into these levels and same thing on the short side. So like, you know, let's say I had, you know, a, a few lines all the way up, like I'll just draw some on here. Just, you know, just for an example. So like, let's say these, you know, these, these lines are on my short lines. So if it was down here, 
maybe I'd short like, you know, a 10th of my size here, 10th of my size here, 10th of my size here. And then what I'd be looking for each one of those levels is like, when is it, when is it getting heavy? When's it rejecting? Cause it might come up into these and it might just blow through these first two lines, no problem. And then hit this top one. And then it, you know, and then it might start to look a little bit stuffy and a little bit heavy. And then once that happens, that's when I'll load onto it and, you know, run all the way down as opposed to putting full size on each one of these lines. And then if it blows through that third line, then, you know, I've lost way more than I want to lose. Right. Um, so if we, I'll flip back over to the, uh, well, actually here, while we're still on the line chart, like, again, like just if you look at these levels, this is why I love the line chart, you know, like this one here just got blown through because I think it gapped up over. But this one here, I mean, like, look at that, you know, the stock came right up, it hit off it like two or three times. And then once it broke through, did the same thing it did down here, it pulled back down to it and then it ripped up, right? So these little, these little, these little jogs on the line are, they're so key for finding resistance levels. I love these things. I want to, um, this is a good time to point, point something out to people like, so this is TA technical analysis and you're just drawing support resistance lines, right? Yes. It's, it's fairly straightforward to identify. And it's like, so this is, this is basically what TA is. It doesn't take that much work to read, to learn how to read a candle or a pattern, but the trick and the important part is, okay, well now what do you do with that information? Now that you know where support and resistance is, what do you, what do you do? And what is your strategy to make that happen? Right? Like, right. like you said, we got to size in and size out. Um, like versus versus like just putting all your your eggs in one basket at a certain resistance line, thinking it'll sell off there, or just or or all your your buy order at a certain line, thinking it'll that's where it'll bounce. Yeah, it's kind of a it's kind of a weird mental thing to get over because it's like mm. you know if you're doing a trade, you want to have the best average possible, right? Whereas if you if you're sizing into something, you're never going to get the best average possible. But on the flip side of that, if you're sizing into something, once it goes in your direction, if you know what you're looking for in your trade you can hammer into that thing and then you have a defined risk. Like if you're shorting and you know, the stock, like, let's say you're, you know, your lines at $5 and it kind of wicks through and it goes to say 515 and then it tanks back down. Right now, not only have you seen that line reject, so you can throw all your size at that thing and ride it down. You also have a defined risk now 515, right? That was the top of that wick. So now instead of being like, okay, maybe I'll risk up to the 520 area or the 530 area or whatever it's going to be, you now it's it's giving you a defined risk and it's rejected off that line. So it's giving you two things that show you exactly how to how to play this trade and you can get into it with a lot more confidence, right? Um so yeah, like if we look at this on the candle chart, like again, you know, like it's it's just kind of messy. Like those little jogs that we saw up here, you know, you can't even you can't even really see them anymore, right? So, but that's, that was a big factor over here. Like it, this, this top spiked right into that level, <clears throat> even on this one, to be honest, like this one up here, you know, again, you can't really see it in here, but that was kind of right where we sat on for this one. Like that became basically the low of this candle. Right. And then, you know, like I said before, I get my risk off of the wicks. So for this one down here, if you look at that, this bottom wick here basically lines right up with this bottom wick here. And then over here, once we once we've blown through these lines, then you move up to the next highest line, which would be this candle right here, right? That's your next your next pullback. It, like you just kind of work your way up. So this one's say twenty seven fifty, and then the low of this pullback was you know twenty eight eleven. So you could kind of have like a sixty cent risk on that thing, right? And then you go up, you know, twenty bucks. So that's kind of the way I do it. Like the way that I. The way that I work through my lines is like I I kind of I kind of work like left to right and I use risk levels like like once a risk level is used I almost I don't use it again like I like the way that I the way that I watch my trades work out is that once once something's used it it never gets used twice so like if I have you know if I have like four or five levels drawn on a stock <clears throat> let's say let's say the stock you know if I'm shorting something let's say it spikes right up through levels hits the top one and then it tanks well the next time that it pops up i'm going to be looking to short the next level down and then if it pops into that line and tanks again then i'm going to look at short the next level down same thing long right like it'll come up and it'll bounce off a level and then i'll buy there and then if it gets through the next level i'm going to buy off the next higher level and keep working your way up because like in my experience when something hits something twice or three times it just like 
you know, when it bounces off it the first time, you might have like 80% odds that it's going to work. If it hits that same line twice, maybe there's only 40% odds it's going to work. If it hits it three times, maybe there's only 10% odds it's going to work. So I always yeah. like to just use resistance lines once, and then I look for the next one. Yeah, I think it's important for, for people to realize that this isn't just some random thing that happens. There's people behind every, every one of these price actions. And for me, the, the way I see it is like, and I agree, like you, you, I, I only use... Uh, support resistance. Um, I try to use it as little as possible, just one time, and I and I set a different target. And it's because for everybody, there's a certain price where they'll buy and sell something. Once mm -hmm. it hits that price, that's it. Their transaction is over. Now you have another group of people who have another price, and so yeah. that's why it shifts. Yeah, exactly. And like you know, they always say, "Look left." Like that's kind of the, the age old saying, "Look left." Right. So <clears throat> you know, your charts here. You're looking at it. It's moving up or down depending on what you're doing. So all you do is you start just walking across the chart and looking left and just find where, where's the next resistance. And you say, okay, there's one right here. And then let's say it goes through that one. Okay. And now we start looking a little bit further left to find the next one. That's it's like, it's really straightforward to do this stuff. Like all you have to do is just look at where the chart's moving right now. And then just work your way left across the chart and just draw each re resistance line, use each one once, and then you go to the next one. And then once that one's used, you go further left and use the next one. And then once that one's used, you go further left and use the next one. <laughs> So I got a good, I got, I think I got a good example. Um, Cause I hear this a lot. I see it a lot on Twitter. Like if let's say Tesla rallies or like Bitcoin rallies and, and it gets sold down, you hear all these comments like, who the fuck is selling at this level? Like what's wrong with people? Like, you know what I mean? I'm like, people take yeah. a profit. Like that's who's selling. Or yeah. in, in, in your case, when you're saying look left, it's like people that were you before you, they bought the top, the thing dropped and they've been in the, in the red since, and they're just waiting for that break even to wait to get the fuck out of yeah. that thing. <laughs> exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's what always happens, right? A stock goes down, you know, it bounces. And then everybody that bought in that bounce sells into the pop or everybody that didn't sell is, and it goes lower and then they're like, oh shit, well, I'm going to sell once it gets back up to this level. Right. It's, you know, it's just, it's a combination of, of really very simple technical analysis and just like human psychology. You know, you know what thing reminds me of kind of it, it, it's sort of like analogy. You remember, you know, uh, Ouija boards, that thing where it's like, you know, that, that old board game. It's, yeah, yeah. The market's almost like that. Everyone's got their hand on that arrow and everyone's got their, you know, reasons to be pushing or pulling. And that's what's happening with the price. It's just kind of like, you know, yeah. one day these guys are in power and the next day these guys are in power. It just moves around like that. Yeah, exactly. And you just got to basically just try and be on the right side of the momentum, right? And that's, that's, again, one of, the, one of the big things between being a trader and being an investor is if you're a trader, you, you have to be on the right side of the trade. You have to be able to flip back and forth. Like, you know, I can, I can short a position and then get blown out and then immediately go long because I can flip my bias just like that because I know like, okay, well, if it's gone through this level, I know everybody else was trying to short at this level. So it's probably going to be a short squeeze now because I know that everybody sees what I see. So all these guys are going to get blown out. All the longs are going to be chasing this thing up. So let's buy it. I think, um, I think that, 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 that brings up a really good point because I think some of our best conversations happens on the WhatsApp group and like, it never makes it to the show and like, it's kind of <laughs> sucks. But I mean, the, we had this nougat of, of gold with, of wisdom uh, one time we were like saying, um, um, I don't know, how do I word it? It's like, it'll come back to me. I'll, I'll, I want to word it correctly because because it because it hits nice. But but going on the but going on the trading thing though, like I think people have to put aside the idea that um, it's going to be quick because most of our lessons you learn over time, and we, we can't control when the lesson gets taught to us. It just it just happens, right? right. And so people should, I don't know, I, I think uh, whatever your what, what your opinion is, but I think people should be prepared to put in a lot of work and lose a lot of money before they can do this well. Right. And then on the flip side of that, if you're not really interested in trading, then you can just invest and buy long term. You know, we were talking about this before the show, just buying, buying indexes, you know, buy the NASDAQ, buy the S&P, buy the Dow Jones, and just, you know, just sit on that stuff for retirement because those things average, you know, 10% per year, every year. And if you're going to buy something and hold it for 20 years, you just get that compounding interest and it just grows and grows and grows. Like if you, you know, if you think 10% per year, you can say, oh yeah, you know, I'm going to put 10,000 bucks in this thing. Like I'm only going to make, you know, I'm only going to make a thousand bucks this year or whatever it is. But 
if you think about it down the road, like think about like what was the what was the Dow Jones in the seventies, like a few hundred bucks or something like that, and now it's like thirty some odd thousand, right? So it's compounding. Like if you think like say the S and P was a hundred dollars a share, it goes up ten percent. Like okay, you've made ten dollars a share, but then down the road, now the S and P is worth a thousand bucks. So when it does its same ten percent, you're making a hundred dollars a share, and then down the road again, when it's worth say ten thousand dollars a share. It goes up 10% again, and now you're making $1,000 a share. So on, on that original investment, you know, where the first year you were only making $10 a share, even though you haven't put any more money in, way down the road, now you're making $1,000 a share every year, and it keeps going up, right? Actually, so going on the, the, the theme of back to basics, I think we, we should explain what the S&P is. Um, yeah, so and like how, yeah, and how you can play it. Okay, do you want to take that or? Yeah, I, well, uh, so like the S&P 500 is the group of like the top 500 companies uh, by market cap in the U.S. So it's like it used to be that you could say you could tell the strength of the U.S. economy by looking at the S&P 500. But the problem is the last, I want to say, five to seven years, the FANG stocks, the Facebooks, the, the tech infrastructure plays kind of took over that thing. And I, I don't know what the per exact percentage is, but those like group of maybe half a dozen companies are overweight the S&P. So when they move, it moves the S&P. Yeah. Um, but if you still maintain the idea that this is a snapshot and of the strength of the U.S. economy, then buying the S&P is basically saying that you're confident that the economy will continue um, doing well and giving returns. And then you invest in the S&P through vehicles like ETFs, exchange traded funds. And so there, there I think there's going to be there's a few uh, options out there. But the reason they're great is that you can buy and sell them just like stocks. They, they're, they're funds that essentially hold shares of these companies and you're just buying shares of this, this fund. And the great thing about them, we were just saying earlier that they basically um, destroyed the, the mutual fund market because they have way less fees. It costs like a, a percent of, of your investment to maintain the fee yearly. Yeah, that's, yeah, that's, I've been doing like a lot, of, a lot of reading into that recently and I learned a lot of stuff I didn't know. But like, if you look at, you know, like a mutual fund, for example, or like in the, like here in Canada, we have our RSPs in the States, they have their 401ks. Um, the problem with those that a lot of like, probably like 80% of people don't realize is there's so many more fees associated to that, that you don't even know you're paying. So like, if you put your money in a mutual fund, um, what happens is, you know, you're basically, you're giving your money to a fund manager who's going to take a percentage of your, your profits or percentage of your money, whatever it is, you know, on the low end, they're probably like maybe 2%. On the high end, they could be even 4 or 5%. And there's like, I think there's like nine or 10,000 mutual funds out there. And there's only like maybe 37 or 4,000 stocks out there. So there's like almost double the amount of mutual funds in stock. And I think the stat is there's only about 4% of mutual funds that actually beat the S&P on a regular basis. So, you know, let's say best case scenario, because the S&P, I think it's a half a percent or 0.05. I can't remember what the fees are on that. Whereas the best mutual fund, you're looking at 2%, right? So you're looking at like paying a way higher fee and whichever mutual fund you pick, you're basically only have a 4% chance of picking one that's actually going to be the S&P 500. And how long are they going to continue beating the S&P 500, right? So if you look at it in terms of like long-term growth, and that's why guys like Warren Buffett and Peter Lynch and you know all these big time investor guys, they say, if you're an average person, just buy a basket of indexes, buy the NASDAQ, buy some of the Dow, buy some of the S&P, you know, just put your money in those indexes because you're paying incredibly low fees and you're just gonna sit on that and just earn that compound interest for your retirement. Like, I don't know what the exact numbers are. There's a, you know, there's a million calculators online you guys can use, but like, if you were to put like 30 grand into the S&P when you're 30 years old, by the time you're in your 60s and you're retired, it's gonna be worth something like a million and a half dollars. So if you can just sit on that money that whole time, just let that compounding interest work, let those dividends keep rolling back into the stock, like you're good, you can literally take $30,000 when you're 30 years old and that's your retirement fund and you're done. <laughs> Whereas if yeah. you put that, if you put that in a mutual fund, sorry, but they, the, what the mutual funds do as well is they're basically buying and selling and trying to pick the best, the best companies for you. And they're actually trading. So you, you basically end up having to pay regular commissions on their trades. You have to pay taxes on their trades, depending if it's less than a year, you might have to pay capital gains tax or not. And so there's all these other fees that are associated. You're paying a higher percentage for them to manage your money and you have a really, really low chance of getting returns. So, you know, instead of, if you're not interested in trying to buy, like find companies or, you know, 
anything like that, like, like for me, I, I like, I would never give my money to a, to a fund because I just, I just don't trust anyone enough to make those decisions for me. I feel that the decisions I make are going to be better for me. And, you know, like I said, I mean, it, the, the best place to put your money is in indexes because there's just the smallest fees and you're betting if you're betting on an index, you're betting on the entire American economy. You're not betting on one company. You're not betting on, you know, some guy to, to trade your stocks for you. Yeah. And actually it's, uh, it's gotten exciting these days with the indexes. You can, um, there's, there's a different flavor for everybody. So the S and P has an ESG, uh, fund. So that's like, um, socially conscious, um, renewable energy, those kind of things. So it's a basket of companies that are, that fit that mold. Um, I, Brandon, I wish he was here today. Cause he would, he could have answered like a lot of these questions really well, but but yeah. he's heavy into semiconductors, so he's got he's got the semiconductor uh, ETF, right? Yeah. And it's like a snapshot of all the semiconductor plays. And then there's like, so even within the ETF space, you could you could just buy the Nasdaq if you're if you're long technology, yeah. right? So there's there's a lot of options. It's not like it's not like boring. I could say you know it's still interesting. Yeah, and like, but that's the biggest thing, right? I mean, you just have to you just have to not rush. You have to not panic out. That's the other big thing too. Is like. You know when the when you have those those bear markets and you know those those corrections because like every single year i think since 1950 the spies had like a 10 percent correction at some point so and then you know that and then the news gets all over it and they're like oh it's the end of the world it's going to be the next bear market like we're going to lose everything because that draws in viewers and that's how the news makes their money is they get more viewers right so how do they get more viewers they scare the hell out of it. like i haven't watched the news i don't think i've turned on the news in like four years I literally never, ever watch the news because it's all garbage. <laughs> the but only thing like, you've missed out on is stress. Exactly. Like, I, like my parents, they watch the news religiously. Every time I stop by their house, the news is on. And I look at it, I'm like, oh, great. Another day where everything is awful everywhere. <laughs> <laughs> like, why do you watch this crap? It's annoying because like half the time it isn't even awful, but they'll take the awful spin. Like the S&P will be down 1%. percent you will be like, oh, the market's down today. <laughs> I know. Yeah. You have like one little red day. It's like, oh, the markets are down. You got, you got some guy on there interviewing, like, is this the next, you know, 2008 recession? He's like, well, there's, there's a pretty good chance. I mean, we're down 1% today. So, you know, they just, they try to scare everybody because they feel like, they feel like everybody is, you know, they're, they're, they're assuming everybody's stupid. And I like, you know, all you have to do is just ignore it. I mean, you know, if, Put it this way, if the S&P and the Dow and the NASDAQ were to crash and just keep crashing for decades and go down to zero, we'd have a lot bigger problems than just people losing their investments. There would be a lot bigger problems. So it's never going to happen. Yeah. And like, um, I think off camera, like I've, I've like criticized Warren Buffett for his recent investment choices. And if you look at Berkshire, like you could, you could see clearly the time when technology started taking over. And he was kind of out of touch. Like he didn't buy Apple until like mm -hmm. it was well into two 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 thousands. And Intel was his big tech play, like thirty years later. So, but I, I do keep saying that his wisdom is timeless. And like a couple of things that he says, like the, immediately from what you were saying is, um, uh, he he al always says the market is a mechanism that transfers wealth from the inpatient to the patient. And so most yeah. of the people losing that money is just people that are that are inpatient. I mean, don't you find that a lot of times, especially when you're starting out, you were right. You were right. You just acted too too early. Yeah, for right? sure. But that, that goes back to that old thing where if it's an investment or a trade, right? If it's a trade, you don't necessarily want to be patient if it's going against you because it might have broken your risk. But if it's an investment, like if you're thinking like, okay, I need some money. Like, how do I save money for retirement? You know, how do I save money for, you know, my kid's college or education or whatever? If you put a decent amount of money into all these indexes, if you add throughout the years, you and you just don't touch it. Like if we go into a 2008 recession, look at where the price is now compared to 2008. Here we are 20 years later. If you had a panicked and sold all your S&P at the bottom and been like, oh, this is the end of the world. And then just and then just not gotten back into the market, you've given up on massive profits. So uh, even if we go, even if it's selling for three years, just hold on to it. And all you can do is use that as a buying opportunity. Now you're buying it at a way cheaper price. Every single bear market in history has been followed by a bull market. I, 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 I've said this before, and I think it's worth mentioning again. Like what really helped me uh, when I first started investing was that I didn't, there, there wasn't a TSFA back then, but there was an RSP, a self-directed RSP account. And so when I left my old company, uh, fucking mutual fund people, I took the $7,000 that I invested with the company 
I left and I was like, I can do this better than this jackass. And yeah. so I put it into RSP and because the money is essentially locked up, it forced me to think only in long term. Whatever I'm buying, I'm like, I'm not going to spend this on a car. I'm not going to spend this on a house. This is for me when I'm old. Yeah. And so my, my, my decisions were all mapped like way into the future. And it helped me kind of, um, kind of that it kind of shaped my, my philosophy and how to, how to invest in stocks and how to look at them. It, it's only like short term. Um, I'm sorry. It's only just long term views. Mm -hmm. Yeah. That's the and, biggest thing everybody's nervous about saving for retirement. Right. So. And the thing is like, and that's the thing, like no, who saves for retirement anymore these days? I mean, that's what our parents used to say. I think maybe, you know, people like five years older than us, 10 years older than us, maybe we're doing that. But I don't, I think most people aren't saving for investments, uh, sorry, saving for retirement anymore. And so like investing, passive investing actually might be more important now than ever. Just yeah. put some money away, scroll some money away every couple of months or maybe once a year, you get that nice tax deduction, you know, take two grand off your, your, your income and then just put it, um, put it into an RSP or a TSFA and then buy an index or something. Just, just, it's just scrolling money away. Just consider it scrolling money away with maybe a four to seven percent interest yearly. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then that just grows and grows and grows, and then you're like you're set. Like you, it just makes so much more sense. We've said this a million times, and putting your money in a bank because if you put your money in a bank, you're you're set. You're just losing money because the, there's inflation in the economy constantly. So ten thousand dollars today, who knows? In thirty years, maybe it's only worth a thousand bucks. Whereas if you put your money in in the markets and the indexes. Ten thousand dollars today, you know, thirty years from now, it could be worth thirty thousand dollars because you've, you know, you've beaten the economy, right? So, see, that's a really interesting conversation. Now, are we at a point where holding money, cash, is actually the risky position? Hundred percent. Think it, like think about what things cost when our parents were kids, right? Like, you know, they say like, you know, my my parents like, oh yeah, I bought my my first car brand new for two thousand dollars. Like a nice pickup truck now is a hundred grand. A hundred thousand dollars. A brand new house fifty years ago was, you know, forty thousand yeah. dollars. It's insane. So like back then, you know, let's say you're like, oh, I'm just gonna save my thirty thousand dollars and I'll I'll buy a new house when I retire. Like, ah, surprise, cheapest house you can find now is a million dollars. <laughs> yeah, it's crazy. Um and I, I think the the second thing I wanted to say about Warren is um he has a famous quote about interest. He calls it the eighth wonder of the world. Uh, it's our mm -hmm. compound interest. And it really is. Like, uh, off camera, we, we was talking about the stat earlier. Like, if the S&P 500 grows at a 7% rate over 10 years, you just doubled your money. Mm -hmm. And, like, I, I know some people who especially who are looking at, like, the volatile stock prices of GME and AMC going, well, I could do that. And or the price does that in, like, a week or whatever. But I'm like, realistically speaking, <laughs> if you just put money... <laughs> in the s p 500 right you're in your 20s call it 30 years you're in the market you're doubling every 10 years it doesn't take that much many doublings for your for your little you know your stash to become something that's really meaningful yeah yeah it's so it's the eighth wonder of the world it's a generational thing right like i mean to be fair i was like that when i first started trading too but like yeah i've, I've matured a little bit since then and <laughs> reassessed everything but yeah, it's just, I think it's just a generational thing. Like everybody just wants to get rich quick and some people will, like some people are going to make tons of money and, you know, in these crazy stocks and, you know, but if they're smart, they'll just throw it into the S and P or throw it into some investment because the, these are like, these are once in a lifetime things like, like trade, like traders don't buy and hold stuff like that for that long because there's no way to tell how high it's going to go. Right. Like, you know, you look at like GMC, like I, I, I can almost guarantee there's no truly experienced traders that bought that thing at like 40 bucks and sold it at $500. I guarantee you they were all buying and selling and just trading it on the way up because they know that these things don't happen, right? So all the people that are uneducated, they think, oh, this happens all the time. Every time I see one of these, I'll just put my whole life savings into it and I'm going to be a, you know, multimillionaire, right? But it's, it just doesn't Actually, work. That I think we can anecdotally prove that no trader did that because like most traders Twitter sphere, if they nailed something, they'll make sure everybody knows they nailed something. And yeah. I didn't see a single post from anybody that said I bought it 40 and sold at 500. No, the only people I saw posting that were people that were like 
just they're like, oh, look at my Robinhood account, right? Because <laughs> they have yeah. no idea. They have yeah. no idea. And yeah. like, um, I think we think we should wrap up wrap up soon. But I think the uh, the one thing I did want to touch on for investing is that, like, like it, passive investing is a good idea. I think for a lot of people, like again, you have to identify your personality. Mine was. I realized it's because, so I, my, the first book I ever read was Warren Buffett's The Snowball. So, so I, I got his philosophy right off the bat. But then I also knew that I'm starting off with $7,000 and it's supposed to be my retirement. So I obviously need to kind of uh, in, get more exposure, get more risk, and then to get a higher return, right? And so what I, what I what worked out for me was that I, you, you guys know I love doing research. It's just what I do. And so what I found was like, one of the best trades, and this is Lynch's game, the best trades is to find companies that are creating new industries. And be, so the upside potential is just, it's, it's unlimited, right? Like mm -hmm. you see the news today, you know, Tesla, and, and, and I'm, I'm a Tesla bull and I'm fully going to admit Tesla's going to lose market share in the EV space. It just happens, right? Competition is going to come, it's going to happen. But, but so what? Because the entire space is growing. They could lose 50% market share in a, in a space that's growing 100% a year. The pie is just growing massively. If they even take a quarter of that pie, this is a very, this is a trillion dollar company. Yeah. Right. And so what I like to do is I like to find these pivots in industries and technology and then trying to get in early um, and, and position myself. And so mm -hmm. this just, this, this thought last week, I was telling you guys, um, I found out the Mio did an IPO and, um, and I started sizing in, I started taking positions like last week. And, um, this goes back to what both Lynch and uh, Warren Buffett say. They're, they're like, um, they recommend that everybody trade within their circle of competence. So there's always something that you know more than somebody else. Like if you work at a Ford plant on any level, you probably know way more about Ford specifically than I do, probably about the car industry, right? And so that's information, that's an advantage, right? Mm -hmm. So people can take, take inventory of their knowledge and their interests and try to, so, because the the reason I knew about Vimeo is because I've been a subscriber for nearly seven years. 2014, I, I've been a paid user for seven years. That's saying a lot for a guy that's bootlegged his entire life, you know? <laughs> and so, it's so like, I know the software that they're using. I know their strength. I know exactly why I use them and not YouTube for my purposes. And so, I, I knew right away the strength of this company. What I didn't know, what I still don't know, is how big... Um, how big their industry is going to be because people think they're competitor to YouTube, but they're not, they're kind of playing a different game. And I have some thoughts on it. I'm still working out, but, but if I'm right, they're going to, they're, they're going to take a nice share of, um, of a new industry. And so, so that's my bet. So I like to find these companies that are like, they're not me too companies. They're kind of, it'll be like a, a SpaceX or a Starlink. It'll be companies that are like revolutionary kind of on the edge. And you don't quite know where it's going. That's that's where the risk is, but but you see potential. You can kind of quantify it. I I, I like to do quanti quantitative analysis and qualitative. So qualitative is looking at stuff that's less data driven. That's more like intuition. Like what is Elon's character? What's the CEO's character? What's you know those kind of things. So I look at those things and I'm like, I like the CEO of Emil. And that was not a quantitative thing. It was a qualitative thing. I just I liked her character and I was like, I think she's going to lead this company to do great things. So, yeah. so that's all I want to say about that for, for investing. Yeah, that's a really good point. And it's definitely a good way to go about it. Yeah. Um, anything else you want to leave on for traders? Cause I, most people, I think listening, want to be traders. <laughs> Everybody wants to be a trader these days. <laughs> yeah. Well, you're a new trader, get ready to lose for a lot of years. So don't risk a lot and then, uh, stick to it. And you know, you just, it's basically just about finding what works, take a lot, collect a lot of data, track everything you do. You know, screenshot a million patterns that anytime you see something move a lot, just take a picture of it, take a picture of it in 10 different time frames. You might see something different on different time frames and just keep saving stuff. Just collect, collect data, collect data. And then all you can do, you know, after two months of that, you can sit there and, and you can pull up a thousand charts and then you'll, you'll immediately start seeing similarities. It's a lot harder to do in the moment. You literally just reminded me of the thing that in the chat that I wanted to mention. It was that um, when, when we're wrong, well, first of all, we get into a trade because we did um, analysis. And we came up with a thesis of how the price should play. And mm -hmm. then what I was saying was that we, 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 you know to flip when the play is broken. And it's because you have such conviction in what the price should be doing that the moment it does something else, you're like, this is, you're pulling the shoot. This is, this is wrong, 
right? Yeah. And that's the difference where like, if you don't have the experience, you don't have the conviction in that trade, you, you're kind of questioning the price is going against you slowly, slowly, and your losses are accumulating and you, but you're questioning it. You're not acting. Mm -hmm. So it's like, it's really important to follow your lead and just have the data to back up your moves and to be like instantly recognize this is not working. And then yeah. Get out. Yeah. And even still, like I still have trades where like I'll, I'll size into something and then I'll cut it. And then, you know, I'll look at it later on, like on the weekend or whatever. And I review it and I'm, I'm, I'll, and I'm like, it's right. There. How did I miss that? Like, that was just a stupid mistake. Right. You know, I see a level that I just missed and that's fine. But regardless, what my plan was in that moment was to cut it if it gets to here. So I cut it if it gets to there. There's no emotion like, oh, I have to be right. Or, you know, like they always say people, a lot of people would rather be right than make money. Like, I'd rather make money. <laughs> like, exactly. I'm wrong. All I'm wrong all the time, but when I'm wrong, it's, it's, it's like, eh, I was kind of wrong, but when I'm right, I'm <laughs> very, very right. So <laughs> that's perfect. Like that's Lynch's entire career. He was right about Walmart when they had like 50 stores and they were like in three States. He was right about Toys R Us. He knew he was like, well, he asked, a, he asked a very simple question. Walmart's a great business. They're only in like a half a dozen States and 50 stores. What happens when they take over the country? What happens when they take over the world? Yeah. He only had a few of those 10 baggers and he made an entire career. He turned a million dollar, um, he, he turned a fund that was made uh, specifically um, for him to take over. Like it was like a few million dollars and he turned it into a billion dollar fund. Magellan, like, Same. and he, and he only had a 10, 15 year career. Like he, he retired early. Wow. That's my inspiration. We'll be billionaires. <laughs> I, I just want to retire and not have to worry about grocery money. <laughs> you're thinking too small man you gotta bet it all <laughs> I'll, I'll do the next uh, i'll do the next amc i'll short okay. the next amc all right i'll join you i'll be on the other all side right. <laughs> all right all, all right, right brothers take it easy see you guys